Je ne peux pas When I hear the phrase I think of when you are out cheering and you're trying to catch one of those last weathers and he flies through the air, headbutts you in the eye, uh, leaves you with a nice bruiser, and then you continue shearing. You get it done. You figure out a way to, to make it work despite everything that may be mounting against you. Uh, that's what I think about. And then you plan the next butchering. <laughs> Man, it, you know, there's a, there's a song from uh, Bruce Springsteen, and it's our anthem song. Because when we're really when we're down and out, um, I put that song on, and it, it you know it says there's going to be hard times coming, there's going to be good times coming, but there's also going to be hard times coming. Um, swing that ball at me because I'm going to I'm going to grab it and I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work as hard as I can to do what needs to be done. You know, it, it, it's, it's just being honest and upfront and working your butt off, you know, bring that wrecking ball on is, is, is all I can say. And that's, that's what I, the word, you know, is, is that. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our latest segment of Call with a Bay. Um, I am so, I am, well, first of all, I'm Christine Ami. I am the Navajo Cultural Arts Grant Manager, and I am so excited to bring to you today um, possibly um, some of my most favorite people in our program and possibly in the world. Um, we have a wonderful panel planned for, as part of our Navajo Cultural Arts Week, we decided to bring together, since today is actually going to be the announcement of our best of show winner and our JURD and specialty award winners for our Navajo Cultural Arts Week exhibit, we decided to put together a panel um, with our previous best of show winners. So um, starting in 2016, our program decided that what better way would there be than to create an exhibit to demonstrate to our community members the absolute brilliance that is coming not just out of our program but out of our our community members in the areas of Navajo cultural arts and so every year we have hosted this exhibit the first year we only had four participants um, and this year has grown to an exhibit of 40 pieces which is being highlighted mm -hmm. by the Native American art magazine um, and so to see the growth of that and to watch these individuals go through the program uh, we thought it would be wonderful to have the previous four year best of show winners uh, join us today to talk about the challenges, to talk about the successes that they've had and to see where the program has brought them today. So uh, without further ado, I would like to go ahead and um, open up the floor to our four uh, panelists today. Um, who wants to go first and introduce themselves? I'll go. Chanel, this is a uh... 
and I'm originally from south of Tailey out towards Black Rock area. And I also live down in Chinle and um, I work for Navajo Nation with the Navajo Nation peacemaking program at this time where, as a traditional Diné researcher. So I'm also here today representing my, uh, my organization over there too. And um, I'm proud to do that and represent also the cultural arts program here, which is, is a tremendous program and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome, Nala, thank you. Who would like to present themselves next? I'll go next. Hi, everybody. My name is Heather Williams. Uh, um, I am from Lukachuga, Arizona. Um, this is where my, you know, my grandmother, my great grandmother, um, where they reside. Um, I currently live in Chinle right now. I am working with the Navajo Nation as well under the judicial branch. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently just had a little girl, so I kind of took some time away from weaving and everything um, to take care of her. Um, and with the whole pandemic going on, um, most of my time has been geared towards, you know, caring for her. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. All right, so I guess it's up to me. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Carlin Abing does she do ne? She don't can she cheat in the shed? I call um said lead the look at look at your clay of a chance of a chance. But then no shot. Um, Irish muscle star. He be Irish jet. She jay kiss on it. I don't should shade all to her genie that she never don't kiss on it. So. I am the um, owner and artist of um, CP on the Arts LLC. So um, I actually do this full time. Um, I'm also a BFA student here at college. So thank you. Thanks guys for joining us. And Brandon will be joining us um, rather shortly. He's having a little bit of technical difficulties as we all have been facing every once in a while <laughs> throughout the past year. But I wanted to, I guess, start off our conversation with talking about how you got involved in the Navajo Cultural Arts Program to begin with. <laughs> Well, for me, as I was um, working at, a, at the student services at Tsehili at the time, this, I heard about this program and I immediately was interested because um, I've always been interested in Navajo cultural arts, just Navajo culture in general, since I was a kid. So I've always been involved in things that was about culture. And so this opportunity came up and um, I was still working so I, I applied for it anyway and um, got in and started the process of taking classes. So my biggest um, attraction to it was just that it was a program that I could do in addition to working at, at the time, being um, on the staff with the counseling services over there. So that's how I got into it. And, and, and um, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Well, we're happy that you joined us for sure. <laughs> Heather, how'd you find out about this? Um, so for me, I had just recently graduated um, from Cornell University, um, so I had moved back to the reservation. Um, I was in the process of completing or starting my internship with the Diné College Land Grant Office, and I heard a radio announcement about the program on KTNN, and so I was like, oh, you know, that's a pretty cool program. Um, so I figured, like, I was interested in learning more about weaving, because my great grandmother, Grace Ben, she, she used to weave as well as my uh, my Nolly, Laura, Laura Williams, she used to weave as well. So knowing that history and coming from that kind of bloodline, I wanted to also learn for myself and you know for my siblings. Um, so that's the reason why I decided to apply for the program. I was actually on my way to <laughs> my internship in Colorado when I was trying to fill out my application um, and I was going to be gone for like two weeks the, during that time so I had filled out the application everything and I told my mom I was like all right you got to get this in for me so 
thanks to my mom <laughs> with her help. Um, of course, she was able to complete my paperwork and I was able to get in. And I'm really glad I did because I did learn a lot in the program, um, not just about myself, um, just more about my culture um, and learning a little bit more about our origin stories, our history, um, as well as the arts history of, you know, weaving. And it wasn't just weaving that I specialized in or that I got to learn about. I got to also learn about moccasin making, um, silversmithing, and we also learned how to uh, make baskets out of sumac. So that was really, that was really cool. And that was really interesting. I know you're bringing back all these memories of like a lot of the hands-on activities that we got a chance to do, which we'll talk about a little bit um, towards the end of the program, uh, how everything's been transitioning into distance learning. Um, but before we jump into that, Carlin, would you like to introduce yourself and how you got, well, how you got into the program? Um, yeah, and um, actually, you know, the, um, I guess the most exciting part of this program is how it's, we're, we're a family, and I don't know if anybody noticed from our introductions that we, we really are literally all related. Um, <laughs> Heather is my mayaja, and Brent is my brother, and um, the program coordinator is also my sister, and um, the uh, grant manager is my wife, you know, so I got to, I got to see this program start from, from just this idea. I remember my wife coming home and talking about, well, there, I, I heard about this program that uh, CDS is getting ready to start up. And so I remember calling, um, calling um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, oh man, I can't remember, Annette. I remember calling Annette on the, on the fifth floor and asking her, what do you know about this? And she said, well, call Crystal, not Crystal, and call Thomas Little Ben. See, then there's another family member of Crystal Little Ben. And so we, it all snowballed from there. And next thing you know, I, um, I'm, here we are. You know, this, we, we went through and we started developing this idea of what we wanted to be for ourselves. And then the program went and met us part way and told us how we could get there. And so that's, that's, that's how I'm here because I, it feels like I've been watching from the sidelines all along and then just you know, doing my best to try to try to jump in there and try to learn something so no definitely it's been like it's been a crazy crazy ride <laughs> um you know yeah. I'm thinking about that first cohort uh the one that carlin was part of then there were there were four original members and um the exhibit actually took place during their first semester of the programming so typically how we function now is that it's like the culmination of the entire program is when you're ready to to go ahead and submit these these quality pieces but we had started that cohort mid-year I think we started it in January and we're like all right so if we're going to get any traction out of this if we're going to recruit we have to do something big and we have to do it now and we have to do it at the end of the semester so let's pick the third week in April every April and let's make it staple mm -hmm. and let's see what we can do with this exhibit and man Carlin was up for the game Delia I know she's listening um Dwayne and Eileen's online too um they were like okay let's do it it was always yes it was always yes um, um doesn't mean that I didn't have to come stalk some of you guys to get pieces in um actually I think I stalked Heather hardcore too <laughs> <laughs> to get their final pieces in but um you know it's just been wonderful seeing that journey and and now that I look at it and look at everybody's faces I'm like yeah this is, this is all my in-laws it's kind of a scary position <laughs> that I'm in <laughs> um but I guess so you know that's how you guys got involved in the program. What is, um, for you guys, what has been the, I guess, some, an eye-opening moment that you guys experienced in the program that discussed you as an artist, that you could do this, that you could make these pieces and understand the philosophy that was going into it? Was there ever an aha moment for you guys? I'll start off. Um, I think one of the um, primary primary moments that um, that would kind of give me that that sort of um, feeling and this idea of what it is to be an artist and why you want, why I wanted to be an artist and and uh, how I would get there was um, the uh, that that first night that award show when um, Teddy Draper spoke and I remember him talking and saying that well you know what if you if this is not working out for you and he was just so honest and so blunt. And he was and at the same time so eloquent and just, just like a just 
just as though he was actually treating us as like family. Like again, there's that term family. And he, he told us, he said, you know, up your game. If, you, if you're not making sales, if you're not winning awards, if you're not doing the best that you think you can, up your game. Don't make excuses for yourself. Try harder. And so, and then when we go on into the, the subsequent years and every time there was a speaker in there again, they, they had similar stories. I think Sally Black just spoke so beautifully and it just reminds you of, you know, who our, who our people are and why our people do these things. And, and so that my, my uh, those moments for me are always, always the most pivotal and they, they, mean, they make so much of a difference in how you see yourself and, and what you plan on doing with yourself. So. Mm -hmm. Take it away, Nelly. What, what, <laughs> For me, I think moment. when um, I started taking the classes and, and you realize that um, you're taking classes and interacting with people that have this same passion as you about whatever it is that, what, what area, like for me, I chose um, basket making, even though it was something I've never done before. I've seen it then and I know what materials go into it and I know the work you have to do to process all the materials and stuff, but I've never actually made it. And I've never actually thought of myself as making one. I never had a desire to try it. But when I applied to the program, I really had no choice except to go into that area. The other areas were conflicting with other things um, with my work schedule and stuff. So I went ahead and took basket making. And so I realized that um, I, I was, first of all, I was learning something brand new. And for me, that was kind of a really big, kind of the, the biggest aha moment from there. But um, the fact that uh, I was doing something new and interacting with people that had the same interests like that, and the whole program, the way it just was motivating and just um, had this whole setup of, um, it, it really made something that you are passionate about, uh, raise it to a level that you don't see anywhere and uh, as part of a program like this. And so it was just the spirit of the program was just really, uplifting for me and I really got into it with all these other people that were probably experiencing it the same way so for me um, that was how it really kind of was an eye-opener I was having a conversation with Christine last week about um, uh, how she emphasized or in her doctorate program she did a, the her dissertation about butchering and I was thinking about that like you have something that we did and we do every day kind of well you know in our daily lives as the net and so it's a big part of our life is to butcher and, and you know, raise mutton and, and all that whole process of owning sheep. And so I never occurred to me that, it, that you could have a dissertation about something like that and that you could take it to the level that my Nolly has taken it to. And to me, that was like, oh my God, that was like, you know, that's, it just showed me that, that, that another aha moment for me that, you know, wow, you could actually do that. And so what these opportunities that have become available to us through the program, it has, it has that kind of uh, effect to it. It has these connections that they put you up to, they hook you up to. So that's uh, how I, I see it. I remember that because uh, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, check out Brent's work. Brent is a master moccasin maker and Navajo philosopher and just hey. all around uh, cultural up. artisan. <laughs> um, but, you know, he came into the the, you know, when Carly came into the program, he had these interests in silversmithing and, you know, Heather came in, she had these interests in, um, in weaving, for example, when Brent came in, it was like a force of, he was like, well, I'm a moccasin maker. I could take some moccasin making classes, uh, but it doesn't fit into my schedule. So what should I do? And to be quite honest, um, basketry, I've taken basketry classes. We've worked, gosh, with Sally Black and Thomas Yellowhair. And those classes are intense because you learn how to process your materials out of all of our emphasis areas, at least me speaking, and, and I know everybody here on the panel uh, has had these, has taken this as part of our class because you get to experience the other emphasis areas as well as part of the program. Um, you know, you learn how to hunt sumac and sometimes you just, it's an unsuccessful hunt and then you have to learn how to process it and split it. And uh, the, I, I remember the first time I was taking the class and just being so frustrated with splitting and then here Brent comes walking in and he's like all right I could do this and and finding out that he <laughs> couldn't naturally and it was really 
frustrating. I was uh, and failing it, miserably. <laughs> it's frustrating for you know my position and Crystal's position to watch you guys go through that. But then at the end, like I said, I mean, I love Navajo Cultural Arts Week because it really brings the warm and fuzzies. And for those of you guys who know me, I'm not a warm and fuzzies kind of gal. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm getting chased off of Sumac areas. Uh, Zephyrin also commented about that, the legalities of where you can and can't um, hunt Sumac. <laughs> But, um, you know, that emphasis area, and then here Brent wins the best of show with his, his uh, Troche, and then you, you ended up submitting that to the Navajo Nation Fair. Is that oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, total, like every, every experience is an aha moment for, for me, for sure. Uh, Heather, what do you, um, did you have a, a, any kind of moment that you would like to address? Yeah, I guess for me, my moment would be a little bit different. Um, my moment would be when I was finishing my first rug. Um, I made out I, what I thought was going to be a simple design. Um, <laughs> and it did actually, I mean, I guess when you really look at it, it was pretty simple. And I kind of was a little bit overachieving where I made mine a little bit bigger than most of the students in the class. And so mine took the most like time because it was really big. Um, and so when I got to the last few inches, which are the, the absolute hardest, I think that was the moment where I was like, wow, you know, like I can really do this. Um, you know, I have what it takes to make a design and complete it. So, um, and you know, our instructor at the time was Eileen Nagel and she kept saying like, I, I would do like a, a line of a line of uh, wool and then she'd be like oh nope there's still there's still daylight so I'm like oh my gosh like will when will this end <laughs> um so you know when I finished that last piece and she was helping me take my rug down from my loom and you know I was really proud of myself um I'm sure she was pretty proud of me as well and like I said you know just knowing that I could at least get this one rug down and from here on out I can know I know how to do you know, the whole process of getting my loom up, um, getting my warp set up and, you know, making my edge cords, putting it all together. And so from there, that was a moment where I was like, you know, this is really something I can do. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, keep doing it. So that was my moment for me. Um, and then my next rug after that was a little bit smaller. I was like, okay, you know, I made that first one pretty big. That was really awesome. Now this next one, I'm going to make it somewhat a little bit smaller, just so I have a little bit more time to work on it. Um, and so that was, you know, a quick learning, uh, it was a quick learning process in and of itself. Um, and then, um, you know, just realizing, you know, just with this one rug, you know, I can consider myself, a, you know, an emerging weaver. Um, and so that was my moment. And then, you know, along with, learning how to do different types of weaving. You know, we just did a basic weave for our first rug and then moving on to a little bit more experience weaving techniques, you know, which were twill weaves. And I think out of all of them, the twill weave was my most favorite. Um, and that's the, the rug that I ended up winning best of show with. Mm -hmm. So I think that out of all of those different techniques, the twill weave, the twill weave is my, my favorite. I think that's one of uh, Carlin's favorites too. Uh, he's always talking about that, uh, the, yeah. the twill weave. And we actually have um, a fantastic twill weaver in our cohort that's graduating this year, Valine Hatahi. So if you guys get a chance to jump on to our, um, our, our exhibit, which is on Native American Art Magazine, uh, dot com, you'll be able to take a look at not just Valine's pieces, but all 40 images that we do have part of this 2021 collection um, for our exhibit. So um, we do have Brandon. Brandon, can you hear me? Brandon is having some technical difficulties, but I think he jumped on via phone. Are you are you there, Brandon? Yeah, I am. Hey, Brandon. It's oh, Hi. you are there. Awesome. Okay, so I would like to preface that Brandon came to us um, once again as a graduate. Um, uh, you know, he graduated from uh, the Diné College Teacher Ed program, and I remember running into him over at the junction, and he was like, "Ah, Christine, I want to join the Navajo Cultural Arts program, and can I do that even though I'm an alumni?" And the cool thing about the certificate program right, is is that it welcomes back everybody, right? Um, you know, uh, Brandon was a graduate. Heather was a graduate, uh, Carlin was a stu current student, um, and then we had um, 
Brent, who's uh, had his master's. And so everybody kind of came back. And I really liked the way that Brandon uh, approached it because he was an educator and it kind of got into like a little bit of a, a juggling act of schedules, right? Towards the end of the program, because he yeah. had a full-time job. He was certified and he's like, all right, I got to pick this up. Um, but Brandon, I was hoping that you could uh, introduce yourselves uh, to uh, everybody who's listening. We are live on KT, uh, KTN and on KXWR <laughs> Warrior Radio, as well as Facebook and our Zoom, our Zoom room. So if you could introduce yourself and let us know how you learned about the program itself. Okay, well, Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. But I'm in Shla on Sana Bashis Chin, Logat Hachini Dashi Chero Kitachini Shanale. And my name is Brandon Dene, and I'm originally from um, Shiprock, New Mexico. And now I currently reside in Chinle because that's where I'm working now. I'm a teacher here at Canyon de Shea Elementary School, and I teach fourth grade. Um, so, as far as the cultural arts um, program, I honestly cannot remember how I heard about it. I want to say, and I don't know how many times I go around with this with Crystal, because I want to say it was Crystal. And if you ask me right now how I how I met Crystal, I, I honestly do not know. I really don't. I don't, I don't know how we kind of uh, like ping pong that around that but I'm quite certain it was through Crystal that I heard it and also through another um, classmate of mine, um, Trent, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Troy, uh, he, he um, talked about the program and I think it was just kind of like sporadically throughout me doing my last year, my uh, teacher education, I started hearing more about the cultural arts program. So once I heard about it, I, I, I didn't get a job in the fall for by yeah I didn't get a job in the fall but in the spring is when I finally got my um my job here at the district here at um Chinle. so I had a full a full fall schedule open for the or for the program which actually worked out really well for me because I decided to take on three of the uh three out of the four uh content mm -hmm. areas that the cultural arts does provide mm -hmm. so I took on um moccasin making, silversmithing, and basketry. I've always wanted to learn how to make baskets. Always, always wanted to learn how to make baskets. The basket baskets were always interesting to me. It, that was uh, that was a task because, yeah, having to hunt down everything, even the um, even for the the twistje, you have to do, you have to collect all the sap. And I was hitting up all the trees on campus <laughs> just to get up all my sap. I was even um, getting some friends to help me. And I was happy it was, I'm actually, I was happy it was during the winter. I was collecting all of it because I can't even imagine doing that during the summer where, you know, it's really like Jay. <laughs> so collecting all that sap, you just see these two weirdos over there banging at the trees trying to get off all the sap. So on top of rummaging through bushes looking for my key I was doing that is looking for all that sap on campus so that was a lot of fun a lot of work a lot of intense work even just doing that first basket was intense it took a long time just to do it uh, with silversmithing and one thing I should preface is that I am I am visually impaired I do have um, a visual impairment called um, cone rod dystrophy so my my vision my um, vision is twenty two hundred. So if you don't know what that means, that means that chart y'all look at uh, to do your vision test. I honestly can only see the first two rows. I see that big E and then the F and the P. After that, nothing else. Mm -hmm. I'm also colorblind. That to add to that. So when we were doing the um, when we were doing silversmithing. I'd always hear my teacher talk about making the metal cherry red, cherry red this, cherry red that. I honestly was oh not God. able to do it. So going through the silversmithing, never being introduced to silversmithing ever. So I was pretty, I was pretty much a novice to all of this except for moccasin making. So I was very much doubting myself getting into this I don't even know how to do it and I think Crystal had even shared this one story about how when she first started out she was scared about the torch I was terrified of that torch too but after a while you kind of get over that fear because you're trying to get that uh, now now my next task was how am I going to be able to see the metal turn color because I couldn't see it I had to just kind of guess at it and so that I 
so that was also my little int- our entrance into silversmithing is I just, how am I going to adapt this to my disability? I think basketry was a lot easier as far as adaptation to my disability, but yeah, silversmithing was a little bit more difficult. And moccasin making in general, I just like moccasin making. I took a moccasin making class uh, ages ago. It was one of my... Um, one of my electives I did take. So I loved doing that. And it was fun taking um, classes uh, with the with the moccasin um, cohorts. That was really fun because we would shoot ideas off of each other and just see what we wanted to accomplish. Mm. I remember that, Brandon. I, I remember um, somebody asking, they were like, well, who's your most unique student? I was like, well, uh, it's probably going to be Brandon Denae <laughs> um, in terms of like talking about uh, teaching pedagogy, right? Um, well, mm-hmm. also really interesting conversation to have with Brandon, um, actually everybody here, because everybody has had experience running workshops um, and, but taking a look at, taking a look at now and we're like, all right, what kind of difficulties have you run into? I'm like, Brandon was a piece of cake. <laughs> um, that was, but I remember that. I remember having this discussion, like um, frustrations about understanding what cherry red means in, in silver turning and very practical things that we utilize all the time to get our students through. We had to think outside the box. And I'm not going to lie to you when it came to thinking outside the box. Um, Brandon was one of the, he was like, well, if, if um, there's really only one person here who's responsible for thinking out the box for my education, and that's me. And it was really took that philosophy at college at Ego, and you like embodied it <laughs> and, and made it work and made it work somehow. Um, thinking, want- of, um, thinking of that cherry red thing, just a really quick story also, and this will just show you how I was, try- I was trying my best to really focus on getting this like measure are really getting it tacked down and I think this was when Crystal was around she was uh what or she was uh watching over the room as I was doing what I was doing because it was on a Sunday where I was like I'm gonna get this down and <laughs> it didn't or uh, because it because everything was more like because all my instructions were all site based it was like okay you got to see this you got to see the size I didn't real or uh, at one point I was like, I'm gonna get this down. So while I was trying to warm up my metal to um, actually to um, solder, I was trying to solder a piece together. I had gotten so close to the flame and, but the problem is I was so focused on doing it. I didn't realize right here was getting hot my forehead and in this, this forehead area. And I guess I had cinched some of my hair that just happened to be like this, you know, the spider legs. <laughs> so I had singed that and, and finally I got it, but all of a sudden I finally felt that heat right here on how close I was to that fire. And that was crazy, but was, at least I got it. <laughs> it's it's danger there is a danger component there's Um, a big danger yeah (laughs) in all of like the emphasis areas i know we were talking about um like going to find sumac um one of the big things that thomas yellowhair always uh stressed is like watch out for snakes watch out for spiders don't clip your fingers and so but um each one of those emphasis areas for sure and especially now that our weaving program has grown to include wool processing where people are actually you know learning how to shear and pull wool off of off of their own animals there is that level of rate of, of challenge that comes uh, just like natural inherent um, challenges that, that people are facing. So I wanted to jump back into, because this week, as I said, is our Navajo Cultural Arts Week and we have our exhibit that's um, currently up. Uh, and tonight we're going to be announcing our best of show winners and our specialty award winners and all those other fancy shenanigans that we got planned for you guys. Um, but I wanted to uh, take a look back at your particular pieces. I know that you got, uh, the viewers got a chance to see that um, during the opening credits, but I wanted to kind of pull through and pull up your pieces. And if you could talk a little bit about the processes and the challenges, I know that, that it's some, for some of you guys, it's going back like five years, but to think about, you know, those types of challenges that you had to face um, as you were making that piece, uh, to get it ready for the exhibit. So the first one that I have here, let me go ahead and pull that up. Give me one second. You think I would be quicker at this? Let's see. Uh, we have Carlin's uh, Carlin's piece that that we're taking a look at here. So Carlin, could you tell us a little bit about this piece and and the process of getting it ready for the show? Yeah, I absolutely love this piece. It's you know it's really nice to see it again. Um, this piece is actually. 
and it's been sold for quite a while. So um, it's nice to see it. And, um, you know, one of the, um, it's actually, um, it's an overlay, overlay piece with the lower section granulated. And so the earrings, earrings match, they have the same kind of granulation. And then um, the stone is actually a uh, Morenci stone. So um, it's, and that was actually one of the first stones that I remember picking out. I think pretty sure we picked those up at um, the um, Four Corners Gem and Mineral Show. And so one of the, uh, I guess if, if I had to really point out anything very specific about um, maybe, maybe something that was difficult or something that it taught me was that, you know, buffing chain is, that's some serious business. You really have to know what you're doing. You really have to be careful. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that this piece um, actually knocked some skin off my knuckles as, it, as the buffer caught it once. And thankfully it didn't, it didn't actually take any real damage, but um, you know, you, you learn these things. And, and that's one thing that I, I actually really love about, um, about silversmithing in general. And um, you know, not everything has a very clear cut way of doing something. There's always, there's always some way to adapt. Uh, you, know, you can always innovate something and you can always figure out a new way to do something. Sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it's slower, sometimes it works perfectly. Other times, you know, you have to go back to the drawing board and figure it out. And, um, you know, that was something that I learned in my first class because I remember I, I had all these crazy grand ideas of what I wanted to do. And, how, and so I remember asking Wilson the first time I took Silversmithing One and saying, okay, well, how do I do this? He's like, well, try it out. I don't know, figure it out, figure, mm -hmm. try something and see what happens. Did it work? Yeah, it worked. But I don't like this. It's like, well, try it again, see what happens. And so I just remember going back and back and back to, to some things until it works, until until you figure out how to make it happen. And that's one of the beauties of mm. of the uh, the program. You know, you you keep going. And so I remember back back at that point, silver was like thirty dollars an ounce. And so I remember Wilson telling me, you know, keep trying because if you mess up then you can always just cast it down into, into Tufa. And so that I kept that mentality and I still have that mentality today, you know, try something, try it out, take a risk. And if it doesn't work, you can always recast it. So that's, that's, that's what this taught me, you know, keep going, keep trying and don't let your chain get caught in the buffer. <laughs> so maybe we should name this that don't let your, don't let your chain get caught in the buffer. I actually remember coming home and like there's like like blood dripping. I had just come home after that had happened, and I was like, "What? What happened?" And I think I got knocked out for a second, but everything's okay. Here's my piece. I'm ready to submit. And so that's how I received that 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 piece. Um, this particular this particular um set. And uh, where's the set now? Do you happen to know? You know, I don't know who purchased it. Um. Dorothy Ami at uh, Smoking Trails Arts and Crafts on Second Mesa sold this piece for me. And so I don't know who has it, but I hope whoever has it, wears it, and it makes them happy. Yep, so if you do have this piece, send us a photo. We, we love to see where our pieces um, end up finding a home at. So uh, give me one second. We're going to pull up another one of our, our, um, our images here. Let's see. Uh, let's go in chronological order. I think Heather would be next, right? Um, in 2017, uh, this is the piece that Heather took home uh, best of show, best of textile and best of show with. Yeah, so for this piece, I did a diamond twill weave um, and we had just learned this from our instructor, Eileen Nagel. Um, for this piece, I, of course, with I always like second guess myself. So with the colors, I know I wanted to do a red color um, and I knew bl uh, brown would go well with that. And I also needed another contrasting color. So, you know, with the help of my mom, she helped me pick out my colors. Um, and so um, that's kind of where, you know, picking colors came from the background behind that. And I'm, like a pretty organized person so when I was coming up with the design I was like okay I want to try um of course it's going to go like a zigzag and then I also was like um at this time Eileen was showing us with the twill weaves that if you wanted to make straight lines um like in the towards the center and then towards the you know the mid um three-fourths on both sides three-fourths one-fourths on both sides 
um, she said, you know, there's a technique you can do. So I, you know, wanted to play around with different designs with this piece. Um, and I, like I said, I'm pretty organized. So I made sure I have my notes right here that I'm looking back up, look back on. Um, and I wrote everything down. I wanted, I, you know, came up with the design like, all right, this line is going to go this way for this many um, rounds. And then it's going to go back the opposite this many ways um, and back and forth. And I made sure I numbered my pages and I made sure I kept track of everything just so I wouldn't miss um, like miss string, you know, a certain color. So um, and I really like this piece because it's, you know, the twill weave is really thick compared to, you know, just a regular um, uh, just a regular weave. It's a lot thicker. So that's the reason why I like this one. Um, and I really wanted to get this down because, you know, I, I do have horses, as you can see, a lot of pictures in the background. Um, they're rodeo pictures. And I really wanted to make sure that I got the diamond twill weave and the um, just a regular or the twill weave in general to get down so that, you know, in the future, if I wanted to make my own saddle blankets, you know, this would be what I would use. Um, so I'm really happy that this all came together and it came out and, you know, for me, it's mo mostly perfect. Um, and with this one, I, it was a little bit of trial and error with my first rug. I, you know, the design was a little bit off. And so with this one, I was like, okay, at my center, I have to go, you know, so much more, uh, like I think I did an inch more. And so, you know, once you'd started doing the top, it would all start pushing down on each other. And so I figured a niche would be good enough to make it somewhat mostly equal. And this act, this, you know, thinking about it like that and, you know, completing that, um, you know, doing that technique, it really helped me, you know, come up with a pretty symmetrical piece on this one. Um, and I really like the edge cords to be interlocked. I know there's different types of ways you can do your edge cord. You can just, you know, wrap your your wool around it. Um, I really liked how it, you can see on the sides is, you know, twisted. And that was what I really liked. Um, so that's the reason why this one's like that. Um, and I actually have the piece right here with me. Um, and I think I'm gonna hang on to it for a little bit. I don't think I would ever sell it. it looks I don't just know like if your mom would ever let you sell it, but. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I still have it with me right now, um, and it's not, it's, you know, not too big. Uh, again, learning from the first piece that I made, my first rug, I was a little bit overachieving, and then with this one, I was like, you know, this is what I'm going to submit for the exhibit, and um, I don't want to, you know, have to, you know, work on it, like, all throughout, or have to rush on it, so that's the reason why I chose a little bit smaller piece, um, and then, you know, just like how Christine had said earlier, she was hassling me about trying to get this piece finished. And I think there was the last week I stayed up probably till maybe like two, three in the morning, just trying to get as much as I could done. The next day going back at it again. Um, so I'm really glad she, she's, she was our program manager. I'm really glad she um, was on me like that. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have got the piece done in time. Um, so I'm really thankful for that. And like I said, I'll probably keep it as long as I can. Um, I'll probably go up into my mom's room or my mom's house. Um, and as you can see in the background right here too, I do have my ribbons with me still. Um, they're hung up in my mom's living room. Um, so that's my piece. And we call this piece the Bob and Weave. And Christine was actually the one that helped me come up with the with the name. I, I you say it was like the past week. It was like the last day, uh, <laughs> and I think you showed up to our house with it on the loom still. And I was like, "What the heck am I yeah. gonna do with this on the loom? Like, get it off the loom." And I and I think you had like maybe like an inch and a half left. And um, so for those of you guys who are who are weavers or who know anything about weaving, they call that the last uh, the last mile, right? It's it, it takes like a like forever to get that last piece done, especially since and I told her if you look at right here, like how like 
how small her border is I was like you're gonna you're gonna kind of regret this in the end but let's roll with it because it's looking nice and so sometimes mm -hmm. people just need a little bit of an extra umph an extra little push and uh Heather just happened to need a giant one and I'm pretty sure I had yeah. a mom <laughs> and I, I remember with this piece too I was really worried about the warp um because the amount of times I was lifting um you know the the, the handles I the warp was started to wear out and so I got really really nervous because towards the top it started to get really thin um there was a rug right before this one that I completed um I actually have it right here the the warp had it's a really small one as well the warp had um broke on me on top so you can kind of I don't know if you can tell there's a little white there so that's where my warp had broke from from this rug so you know having to I guess experience that I was mostly worried about that with this piece and with the four different um, handles that I was having to use that made it really you know rub against each other um, and that was what I was worried about with this piece but luckily it held through um, and I was able to get it done. Oh, awesome awesome piece once again um, so I'm glad you got it done for sure. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead we'll take a look at at this uh, next piece, which was from our 2018 exhibit. Uh, this one is from Brent. Brent, you want to tell us a little bit about, about this guy? Okay. The picture uh, of this water jug, the Toshche Yeja, actually was my second attempt at uh, making a, a water jug. And when I first uh, went into the program uh, with the basketry emphasis. Um, again, like I was saying, I wasn't really, my wasn't really my first choice. So I went into it kind of with not really knowing what to expect, knowing that I was going to struggle a lot because I've known, like I said, I've never tried this before and I would have to really, you know, have some hardships, which I, that, that didn't sound too appealing, but I still went through it anyway. I had to, it was, you know, do or die kind of things. So I'm kind of pretty much made myself do it. And so my first attempt at, uh, when I started out with um, my project, I, I started moving along, going along, and it started to not look like uh, what it was supposed to be the shape of a basket. It actually started turning more into a bold shape. And so at that point, then, uh, my uh, our instructor, Thomas, um, he told me to just, well, it looks like you're just going to what, what you're making, it looks like more of a water jug, he told me. So maybe you can just finish it as a water jug, he said. So that piece, I just kept going with it the way I did and, and uh, I started uh, creating the water jug. But the thing about the water jug is that um, it's different from the basket because you have to weave the opposite way. The, the bowl goes the opposite way if you're making a water jug. But if you're making a basket, it goes the other way. So that was the difference. But so even though I was still going in the direction of the stitching with the ink, it was in the way that you make a basket. So that made it kind of hard, that first attempt, especially when I got to that area of the neck of the jug. And when you're doing it with the way you're doing it, when the way you make a basket, it got harder right there. And so I barely finished it and barely got to the top and created that cedar weave at the, at the rim and finished it. So that was the first attempt. But when then uh, I went ahead and started the next one. And um, this time I knew, okay, I, I, I wanted to make another water jet because that first one, even though I struggled, it, it was really like a, a pusher for me because it made me want to do another one the right way this time. So I started off again the same way, got all material, my materials going. And I, this time though, I started really putting uh, the, the, the shape, the bowl shape the opposite way like you're supposed to do for a water jug. And then it started coming together nicely all the way to the very end. And I, of course, uh, my second time around, I got a little bit more familiar with how the works and how the best ways to use it. Uh, one of the things I really um, kind of took a shortcut on was uh, um, I never quite got proficient at splitting the key, the, the three steps of splitting the key. Actually, the first one was probably the only one I got good at where you have to, when they're just raw um, shoots of sumac and you use your teeth to split them three ways. 
that was easy to do. I got that one easily. But then you got to do the second splitting again. And then you got to do a third splitting again to get to that nice uh, fiber that you need to make the nice uh, wraps as you're wrapping them around, making those stitches. So uh, not being, you know, I never really got good at it and not being successful at it. I kind of, I, I was really lucky. I had one of my cohort members, Wacy Harvey, brilliant basket maker. He's just gifted at it. He's just a natural. And so it was, he just made the baskets effortlessly. So one of the things he, he I, I actually paid him to provide me with materials. He fixed them. And we went together on a couple of occasions, uh, uh, two or three times within our third, when we were in class. And um, I started just giving him my key and paying him to, so he could prepare it for me. And I know because he would make them good so that I would be able to use them no problem effortlessly. When you have good material prepared in a good way that, then man, it just makes everything work so much easier as you're going as it was with this second jug. So the key was actually prepared by Wacy, but I was the one that then put the, actually wove the whole basket myself. So in that sense, um, this basket I would that, that took that shortcut, but again the the the, the water jug I'm, I mean, uh, but it came out nicely, and it, I went and um, got the gathered the pitch, pine pitch j, and uh, just like I did the first one. Actually, the first one I have right here. This is the very first one that I made. This is that first attempt. This is made kind of the opposite way it should be made. But it was still came out this way, and uh, if you look at it very closely, you'll see my crude stitching attempts, and the, the there's no consistency in the nice uh, rows or the size of the sumac, and there's all kinds of irregularities in there. Of course, you know, as a first uh, first time doing it, you would expect that. But so this is where uh, that first effort went to, and the picture you see is the one that got the award, and this piece actually. Um, uh, Sunny Dooley, former Miss Navajo, Sunny Dooley wanted it and she bought it. So it's in her possession now. She probably uses it for her. She does a lot of trainings and uh, presentations all over the place. So I'm sure she probably has it and, and uses it for something like that. That's awesome. Sunny, if you hear us and you have a picture of it, send it to us because we want, <laughs> like I said, we'd like to see where our pieces are, our students' pieces have, have made it to. Uh, but thanks, Brent. I, I love this piece and I was so excited to see. Um, this was actually one of the first pieces from the program that we saw um, people enter into other programs, which is going to lead us into another topic that we'll talk about. Like the part of one of the practicum, not only do we have to, uh, we ask our students to create these master pieces and submit them to exhibit at museum quality, but we also ask them to learn how to do applications and apply, right, to these other um, art shows. I mean, the Southwest is just phenomenally known for uh, Indian art shows. And so it was the first time that we saw one of our student pieces um, leave our exhibit area and then enter into a larger exhibit area. So I, I, get, I always use you as an example. I'm like, you can do it. You can do it. Just start, start local, right? Start at the Navajo Nation Fair. And then the next thing you know, um, you know, we have Crystal's yeah. here, Carlin's here, uh, Sue's here, Zephyrin's here, you know, all these individuals who are now are submitting and winning over at the Herd Museum and over at Swaya. And so you can you can take that first step and 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 do that. So I appreciate you for taking that jump for for the students. <laughs> so, um, we have next uh, Brandon. Uh, we have Brandon's piece, and Brandon's piece took home best of show from 2019. It was our last show that we had before COVID-19 because last year, um, as I had discussed uh, previously, we, we put everything on hold so that we could uh, focus on distance learning. But this is that piece that took home the best of show from, from that show. Could you tell us a little bit about your reaction to um, that award announcement and how you got the piece done? Quite honestly, I was shocked. Um, for a couple of reasons, but I guess the main reason was because still coming at it, I, I, I am not necessarily, um, how do you say, 
I guess a positive person because uh, I th I didn't think my skills were ready to be even displayed in this way. So I was still using an inferior metal when this one happened. Uh, this one is made out of nickel or um, yeah, our brass brass <laughs> is made out of brass. And I like the rib brace. I like the rib bracelets. Those th that, uh, that was really fun for me. I don't know what it is about pulling the metal apart in this fashion. It was really fun. Uh, and being able to just put in the simple stamp work, I got, I think about seven or nine circle, just quick little dots, just right there on that center, on that center rib. And then there are um, arrows and uh, stacked triangles on the side right here where it would be pinched right here around the wrists. Uh, I really enjoyed making this piece. And I think I kind of just lost myself in it because it was just a fun piece for me to make. Um, the, for me, I, I was trying to really toss around, should I make it more of, um, of a really shiny piece or should I make it kind of, I guess, cloudy? I don't know how else to say that. Um, not so, not pretty much not so shiny. So I decided not to do, not to go overly shiny for this one, but I really liked this piece. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, one of my friends had, um, expressed uh, a liking to it. And then I just, I gifted it to him and from, uh, in, um, in phoenix so i do like this piece but right now it's just it's out or it's with a friend somewhere else <laughs> probably in phoenix or flagstaff but overall when i when i got the best in show for this honestly i was really surprised yeah you know this this piece was an awesome piece when we had our judges come in um judging is uh i i, I will not curse i had a bad experience yesterday where i dropped some unfavorable words by accident in the meeting i won't let that happen but judging is difficult let's just put it that way <laughs> and um it, i am so glad that i don't have to that's not part of my job i'm so grateful that of all the job description of objectives that are in um my position that i don't have to pick out these best of shows. And what I learn, I, and I learn so much when the judging process is going on from, we bring in all these artists who are experienced in, in various um, forms and various emphasis areas. And I, I just listen to them and I listen to all the knowledge that gets thrown out. It's mostly, a lot of times it's done in a in a, a argumentative way. So I guess a positive, happy space. But um, one of the things that I did learn, you know, the reason why they really love this piece is that A, it wasn't done in silver, right? And so that was like a big thing. They were like, all right, well, are they allowed to use what metal materials are they allowed to use? And why was brass, you know, why, what's the history of brass with Navajo uh, metalwork and metal smithing? And so that was one of the, the things that I really took home from it. And that, and, you know, just looking at the concept of the different types of shines um, compared to like the fine polish. And, and so those are those the areas that you picked out, Brandon, uh, the highlight that you actually enjoyed doing what, what people really were drawn to this piece for us. So I was really grateful um, that this that this was selected. And, and like I said, it's always a tough job. I always see pieces in there and, and, and just to hear the debates that go on and the rationale. It's for me, it's always a growing experience. So and with this piece also, um, I got to um, right after the whole thing again, like I said, I was really shocked on why I had um, why I had um, got the best in the show. But I did um, a couple of weeks later, I was able to, I guess I, I, or I bumped into one of the um, judges who explained why that this piece was uh, picked. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And it's the same way too. It was fun actually learning about the history of how it, how or what, what prompted them to go ahead and pick this piece. So that was a fun experience and just learning about the history of why, because it really just came down to the history behind just the art form. And that was really neat. No, thank you guys for sharing a little bit about those particular pieces. I wanted to kind of turn the, the conversation a little bit uh, about, you know, just your overall growth um, in, in a program like this. Um, it's not often that you can find a program in which it develops you in both areas of, you know, economics, cultural knowledge, and technical skills. And that's what our program really focuses on is bringing together a general course of study so that people can take the time and the effort and find the finances to, to reintegrate themselves with this, uh, with the art forms that are, are 
are most calling to them. And so I was wondering if you guys could speak a little bit to your favorite, if you can think about like, I know I've asked you about like a, um, the pieces itself and your experience with the exhibit, but your favorite class in the, in the program that you took. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, I would have to say one of my favorite um, classes of um, of the program would have to be the um, the studio classes. You know, you go in there and um, and just like I said before, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna keep going right back to that that whole idea of family. You know, when you're when you're in there working like that, you know, you're right next to right next to people. And um, you guys, you, you show each other what you're doing and you, you talk about it and then you, you go back and you revisit, oh, well, that didn't work. Oh, well, what do you think? And so you, you discuss with your, with your peers, you know, well, this, you know, I had a bad day. I couldn't solder today and this, it, my, my, my bezel didn't, I can't, I can't get this, this bezel to close properly. And, you know, somebody will have an idea. And so you talk about it. And you, you just kind of go around and you know you get burned out it's a long it's a long process you know sometimes when you're sitting there and you're 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 um stamping or you're, or you're working with the fire for like three hours straight and you know it's it's nice to take a break and go like you know talk to somebody and, and you know kind of work, help work out problems together and that's 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 one of my favorite parts of that so i would have to say the studio classes oh, heather um, I guess for me, it would be a little bit different. I think I really enjoyed, um, I can't remember the class name at the moment, but uh, with Wilson Ronith, just because he shared a lot of traditional knowledge. Um, and I think my most favorite part out of his class was when he would sing to us. Um, it was really nice to hear, you know, his singing um, and him share a lot of the knowledge um, and just I've known about him. My my older brother used to take classes at the Diné College um, when he was in college age, and at the time I was in high school. Um, and he would always talk about Wilson Aranith, and um, I never actually got to meet him until taking the classes um, in the cultural arts program. So for me, hearing his stories, you know, firsthand, and um, getting to know some of the songs from him. I think that was my most favorite class. Um, and it was pretty laid back. Um, I feel like most of the time he would just tell us like all these different stories. And he was actually pretty funny about some of the things he would talk about. Um, he would also kind of throw in a little joke here and there. Um, so that was a nice, uh, nice thing to come to on a Sunday because we had Sunday classes. Um, and that was probably uh, what made me really enjoy a lot of the, a lot of the history um, and it wasn't just about weaving. He shared history about moccasin making um, and just our creation stories in general. Um, so having to hear it again over and over, you know, kind of have it um, get stuck into my into my brain. Um, you know, that was really helpful um, just because, you know, I did go away for school and then having to come back and learning all those again. Um, it was really it was really nice to come home to that. I think that was the philosophy class, right? The, yeah. um, the Navajo cultural arts philosophy class, which so happily, conveniently, Brent has taught for us on occasion. Uh, Brent, do you wanna uh, talk to us a little bit about your favorite class? I did, mine was um, our mock, uh, not, not mock making, the, the basket making class with Thomas Yellier. And just the fact that you could sit all day long pretty much with other people making baskets and preparing baskets and just having that camaraderie and talking and joking and laughing, that was just awesome. And you're all doing the same thing, moving along, even though you're working over here, making your baskets, you know, the, you're getting something done. And at the same time, you're having a good time, hanging out, doing something that's awesome and fun. And so that was my favorite class, but I think um, another class that, um, was also good for me was where um, we had the different people come in, different presenters, which is how I got connected to Jessica Stego and her program at that time. So those kind of resources that uh, came with those uh, classes like that, it was really good to try into that. And I, I really took advantage of some of those. And 
um, actually replicated some of the things they were doing. Like the young lady out of Winslow, is it? Um, she mixed the jewelry. Um, and then uh, she turned, she used the, uh, Facebook to start up her business. And boy, I really copied that and really went to town with that. And I'm still using it to a big extent even now. So those kinds of things, it's the real practical stuff that you know you're going to want to try and use it. And um, those, those kinds of things, that's what I learned from the program, from that class there. And I don't remember what the title of that class is either, but that's where all those presenters came. So th that was very valuable to me. And, but overall, I think for um, I, when I first started the program, I was still working, but the, the program became more important to me. I, I would rather do that than go to my job eight to five. So I quit my job working at student services and I just so started focusing on the program, the cultural arts program and completed it and even went on to take other classes again. And then from there on, um, I kind of launched my own myself after um, my little moccasin making business on Facebook. And it's been really good to me. It's been really something that I've been able to draw on as a, as a resource. So those kinds of things overall, I had really, I never thought that I would uh, be doing that when I was still, you know, doing that work with the student services. That wasn't even something I, considered or thought of when I accepted that position, but it just happened to be there when I got there and I took advantage of it and went through the program. And uh, overall, it has really made an impact on um, my moccasin making business. Um, of course, I've made moccasins pretty much my whole life, but at this point, it really showed me how that I could take it to a different level and to uh, maybe something that a, a resource for the community, for the larger community with it. So that's how it has impacted me. And those are the things that um, I had gotten from those classes. No, it is. I took so much heat. I hate when you guys quit your jobs. <laughs> I, it's, it's very inspiring. Don't get me wrong. And I am absolutely 100% um, um, uh, indebted to your dedication. Uh, but man, you're not the only person. And, you know, it, I think it does speak a lot to people's interest in when they find their passion and they just like, this is it. This is it. They they have that that Oprah Winfrey aha moment, and um, and then they just run with it. But I always I always get a little bit worried, just like I hear because they you know when people come and they tell me that they're going to be quitting their jobs. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that um, Eileen Nagel did that to me. Eileen, are you still on? Eileen Nagel did. The only reason why I have this position is because Eileen Nagel quit her position and she came to me and she said, Christine, will you, will you run this program? I quit my job. So you kind of have to. <laughs> and, um, and so it's, you know, that you guys find that inspiration and it's off of that type of inspiration that really keeps me going. And so, so I appreciate that. And I, and keep that moccasin making, uh, business up and running. And, uh, before before we sign off today, we're definitely going to send out some information so you guys can contact any of our artists uh, that are on our panel today. And so um, who else do we have? Brandon, Brandon, what do we got from you? I've been trying this whole time to think about which one was my favorite class. It's, it's really difficult because every, all of my classes I thought were really fun because they're all hands on. They're right there in the moment because you feel everything you have to struggle to get to the point where you <laughs> get to where you're ending and I was thinking about what Brent just said about having to quit his job it's really difficult to have so many passions and so many um mm. uh projects that you want to do because I because I invested so many or so much time into and Honestly, at the time, it, the, me getting my job, which is kind of spur of the moment, a friend said, hey, we have an open position here. You should apply. I was like, okay, mm, yeah. I'll apply. But I'm, I didn't think I was going to be getting it because, again, I was really new out of college and I wasn't quite certain if anyone was going to take take on a, a novice teacher in the mid in a mid year. So I was like, okay, I'll just go ahead and apply. But by this time I had already invested so much time in the three emphasis areas. When I got the job, I now I had four things that I was focused on. And it was so hard to get that last or get the get to the finish line. But it all the classes for me I thought were really interesting because each of them taught me something new. Um, each of them had a background and it's really interesting when you start to, I guess, 
connect everything all together. You learn all these, you learn the history and the feel and the smell of moccasin making, of basketry and of silversmithing. They all have this, this touch that, kind of envelops you so it's kind of hard to pick just one class that I really enjoyed yeah <laughs> so and this know, is why uh, you ended up with three this areas <laughs> mm -hmm. um, no thanks guys I really appreciate that uh, j just getting that that feedback and letting our viewers know that the variety of different uh, programming options that, that do exist within within the Navajo cultural arts certificate program and as you guys know we we you we spent a lot of time right during our panel talking about the sensory uh, tactile learning embellishments that exist within the cultural arts and uh, that was something that we were really crystal and i were really worried about during this transition period because as you guys know we are about ready to graduate our next cohort that went through the program entirely through distance learning so i'm wow. so excited to hear wow. their feedback yeah. and um, learn how they took on those types of challenges and you guys spoke a lot to the different challenges that you had in terms of pieces and in terms of completing the program because it is it does take time and it takes patience and it takes a lot of growth uh not just as a student but like all together holistically um to step back and and check yourself it's very humbling i've seen you guys go through the program and uh watch you guys present watch you guys deliver your workshops and it's humbling for me because i know that it's also humbling for you guys and so um that's where we're at right now with the transitioning into our our, our distance learning and so once again i'm going to plug our exhibit if you guys get a chance jump over to either our program page at www.navajoculturalartsprogram.org and you can go to our event page and access our exhibit there or you can go directly to our native american magazine uh, dot com and you can access our exhibit online through their gallery space as well um, and all of those pieces once again they um, the classes did continue right field trips like individual personalized field trips uh, but it's different when you get everybody together Carlin had brought up the concept of family um, actually learning and growing and um, Brent talked a little bit about you know joking around and having that that camaraderie and even when you're in a bad mood I walked into some classes where I was like whoa the Juju in here is not great. What's going on? <laughs> um, Brent, who are you picking on? Carlin, who are you making angry? What's going on? Let's clear it up and, and let's start over again. And so for me, being able to walk into those, that, that atmosphere, I do miss it, but I'm so grateful that our students and our staff and our faculty have stepped up to see how we can do it online. And so, so I appreciate that. Um, before we go ahead and sign off, I was wondering if anybody had any stories that they would like to share in general about their experience during the program or about submitting to the exhibit. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that bait. Um, I guess um, one of the one of the things about um, about this exhibit in particular, and um, and actually going 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 and producing something to um, to 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 submit is um, you know it, it reminds you of how much you love this and why you do it. And, uh, you know, it, I spent six days just. Um, just working with silver, um, two days because it was actually a pretty pretty difficult cast that I, a mold that I had uh, produced to cast, and um, you know it just wouldn't pour. And you know it's as simple as, you know somebody may say, well work on the vents. Well yeah I know, <laughs> I know, and I'm working on, I'm, I'm I, it's I got went from okay not enough venting in some areas to too much venting in that area to more venting in another area, but then the silver's only not flowing all the way around there. And so, so it's, you know, I, and I loved every single step of it. You know, I was exhausted, just absolutely exhausted. And um, I made um, just one beat after the next. And, you know, it's, it felt really good. And it, it reminded me of why I do this, you know, and, and so to, and, you know, because it, we have so many things going on right now, you know, in addition to the fact that there's all this worldwide stress of the, the, the craziness going on, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm still a student. And so, you know, it, it reminds me why, you know, to get back into the studio and to, and to be working with a fire 
and and to be be to like doing things like that again it's just it reminds me of why i have that passion for it and and i'm thankful for that and it's you know i'm glad that my hands can still do this and, I, and i'm glad that it's this is something that was given to us you know not just from from the uh from the world and from from our, our deities but also passed down into us ultimately through history and then from the from the institution that we have here for ourselves you know that's and that's that's the best part of it you know i didn't i didn't learn anything about what uh, what i can do from any place else you know it's uh, it all came from here at the net college and and so for that i'm really thankful you know i learned how to work work a torch i learned how to work a paintbrush and and that's it's from here and so the, the this, these are things i think about when i'm here in my in my office and and uh, you know, I'm, I, you just have to be grateful, and you have to say thank you. So, so to that, thank you. Thank you for those words. We appreciate it for sure. <laughs> it does. It takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of patience, and um, and it, it's a family commitment um, when we take a look at some of some of these pieces and the de time dedication. So, awesome. Who else? Does anybody else want to share? I'll just share that I think if anybody is. Um, considering this program that I think it's probably one of the best things you could ever do if you're interested in this area, cultural arts like that. And it's uh, just gonna open your eyes to a whole different way of uh, perceiving art in general, but also perceiving just the cultural stuff about it and all the different areas, uh, the, the emphasis areas have their own teachings and their own connections to who we are as Diné, our history and everything about about clans and and all this uh, beautiful culture that we have and it's just really being to have been to be a part of it is just a, a really exhilarating feeling it makes you just want to have uh, this sense of pride about it and have this uh, really good feeling that hey you know I'm, this is something that I'm proud to say that I work with at this program and so it's something that uh it's, I've really learned to appreciate it and I really learned to really respect it and honor it. And because it's a resource for our reservation, for our tribe, for our people. And I think it's going to grow and um, people that are going to still take part of it and, and experience it. And it really makes me feel good that that, that can happen and that there's a possibility for that. And I want to see it grow and prosper. Shea Queens and Shea Taban says Kiss. And we're us too, <laughs> which is why, you know, we've seen and thanks to you guys. Right. Um, it's it's the exhibit and the way that individuals such as yourselves are able to speak up. We we have been able to grow. It's it's the reason why, you know, our community is the reason why we now have a BFA in silversmithing and a BFA in weaving and we're planning miners now. So um, so it's really because of you. That's what I always tell people. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Nelly. I appreciate it. Heather. Yes, I think for me, the most, um, what I also enjoyed as part of, you know, everything, I, I enjoyed everything in the program, but for me, um, taking the short field trips here and there, that, that was most helpful just to learn about history, um, not just um, in the cultural arts, but we also like two gray hills, I would have never um, you know, gone that way, gone over the mountain that to, you know, that little trading post there. Um, and, you know, we actually got to learn the history there. We also got to go to the Herd Museum um, for their arts and their fair. Um, I would have never gone there, you know, if I hadn't been a part of the program. And it was just nice to get away from a classroom setting and, you know, be with our peers and, um, you know, all get to know each other, you know, outside of the classroom, outside of our emphasis areas. Um, and, you know, connect on a more personal level, um, get to know each other's stories, our, each other's backgrounds. And that was a part that I really enjoyed. And um, also we got to, during my cohort, we got to participate in a shoe game in Tuba City at mm -hmm. the Diné College campus. And that was really awesome. Um, for me, you know, I, like I had mentioned before, I was coming home from getting home readjusted um, to home from, you know, living in off the reservation for four years, 
um, going to school and, you know, having to focus on studies for four years and then, you know, coming to this program where I was able to relax and yeah, I was still in an academic setting and everything, um, but it was less rigorous and it was a lot more fun. I was able to, you know, still use what I had learned from my college and, you know, apply it to this program um, with writing papers and doing research. Um, and that was what I really enjoyed. And then, you know, like participating in that shoe game, um, you know, connecting back with my culture. And that was what I really enjoyed most. And, you know, just getting away and visiting different areas of the reservation that I had never been to, even though I lived here, you know, all my life, you know, I had never really been to those areas. Um, and, you know, finding those little nooks and crannies where I had never been um, and, you know, learning history about those places. Um, that was really, that was really enjoyable for me. No, it was fun. And Crystal just messaged me. She's like, we totally forgot about the shoe games. We can't believe we forgot we did that. <laughs> um, when we took a look at our economic business systems, right? And we looked at uh, where these origins of, of different types of trade and um, in this case, gambling and what were those, what were those areas um, that existed in time memorial stretching into what we have today? And so that was, that, that was fun. I forgot about that. Although I was pregnant. So like, I was like watching, I was like in super visual, weird, like um, chaperoning mode from the hotel room because I was pregnant. So I couldn't be there. And so that was also like very stressful because I knew that all this stuff was going on um, across the road and I was here and I'm like, oh gosh, I please hope that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> and so, but that was, that was tons of fun. I forgot about that. Brandon, is there any, any particular moment that you wanted to um, address before we sign off? Um, so what I really enjoyed uh, a particular moment was in or during um, my my silversmithing um, exploits. <laughs> I decided to go a little. Um, I decided to be a little bit more animated with the piece that I was making, and I decided, and then um, I created a a little butterfly bracelet, which was a lot of fun for me. It, I started off with a basic uh, uh, ribbon band or uh, uh, rib band follow and then I was going to set the butterfly on top and this is something I thought I was not going to be able to do it was for me it was something that was difficult but it turned out really well and I was really happy on just the just the product that it turned out to and <laughs> so many things went wrong with that um that one piece which is which which I was like okay I, I see that I'm heating it too high because one of the ribs it it broke uh while I was buffering I was all happy because I had everything was together but while I was buffering I wasn't paying attention so the buffer wheel <laughs> it just kind of ruined one of the wings of the um of the butterfly so i had to go ahead and um press that back out i worked with i then i decided to add um texture onto the tips of the tips of the wing i even added little cuts within the wing this is the first time i ever tried anything for me that was considered really intricate so that was a lot of fun for me um are doing all that um and I think the one thing I like about the program is even students, I mean, I've heard, uh, I hear students who come in and they are, and this is why I like to preface with, I came into the program not knowing any, any of these, any of these emphasis areas, but students who do come into the program knowing some of this stuff, who have been, let's say, around silversmithing their whole life, who even helped with silversmithing, who helped their parents with silversmithing, they can still, or they, they have the ability to learn so much because what's given to us is really just a is really just a, a starting point. Now, where you take it after that within those parameters, that's really how that's really how you're going to go ahead and build your skills here. And you hear about the program where someone, again, who has been around that the whole time and th thought they knew what they knew uh, really well, they didn't realize that they could take it even further. On top of just the skill level and building upon that, you also get to hear about the history and, we all, we all, we all are. If you do know your history, uh, for wherever you are on the Navajo Nation, we forget that our stories tend to change really quickly. And going off of the example of the shoe game, 
we learned about how shoe games were conducted in the northern part of the Navajo Nation into the eastern part of the Navajo Nation and in the western. We, I honestly did not know uh, that shoe games were conducted differently because I was only exposed to the shoe games in the Tele, uh, in Tele area. But mm -hmm. I didn't know that there were other, ver or other let's say, rules from different areas. So, and I think that's the fun part about that is that you learn about all these different, th these different um, stories, these different uh, cultures that have built around the cultural arts from different areas. And you got, you get to learn about the history. So it was, that, that's a lot of fun. And that's really what, what I'll take away is, and I still have that butterfly piece. I love that piece. I think it's one, because I think it's delicate, it's adorable. And I'm hoping to uh, one day, well, if I can find a suitable place to do silversmithing, because since I'm in teacher housing, can't really do it here. I want to be able to go ahead and see if I can recreate that piece, but this time in silver, the, the butterfly piece, which I think would be so much fun for me. Thank you guys so much. I miss you all. I miss you guys face to face. I can't, I can't wait to see everybody um, once things start to clear up for sure. Um, we ask all of our participants as we sign off. Um, and I know that there's four of us. So if we could think about it, um, maybe um, in a 30 second response, when you hear the phrase tall with a bit, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? I'll start off. I'll go ahead and start. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is being yelled at. Um, and um, I actually, um, it, it brings back really fond memories of um, my aunt or my grandmother and my mother and my aunt telling me to, what's a bad issue, guys? And so that's, that, that warms my heart. It, it makes me feel like I you don't give up, try harder. So. Mm. Janella, I didn't hear it. What was it? What were we? Did we hear? Uh, the title of our series, right? Call with a bit. When you hear that, or with a bit, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, it's all with a bit. You're going to struggle no matter if we try anything new or trying to learn something, you're going to struggle. So you just have to, oh, with a bit. Just, oh, you have to want it so bad and just be there to do it and put in the effort. Oh, with a bit. <laughs> It's hard work on your hands. Do it. Thanks, Nelly. Heather, do you have a response for that? Um, I guess just kind of aligning with being resilient. Um, and you know, us as Navajo people, we are resilient. Um, you know, we've overcome so many in our history, so much adversity. Um, and each and every individual one of us has adversity in our lives. Um, and just, you know, kind of power, powering through that um, and, you know, doing the best that you can. Um, so just being resilient, you know, having to bounce back from anything and, you know, continuing to push forward. Thanks, Heather. Brandon, would you like to add anything? Honestly, when I think of, of with a bit, I think of uh, the, um, the, the NCAP flyers, I keep getting um, notices on Facebook. <laughs> But yeah, so in the, pretty much that kind of sums it up for me. I mean, we are, I'm sure for all of us where we had to struggle so much to even get to where we at, where we ended at the end, even things that we didn't feel like we could do, we still, we persevered. We got, or even me just getting scared about the torch at the end, I was fine with the torch. So it's just that, mm. that, that keep going, even if you fall, keep going. Well, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Call with a Bear, our Navajo Contemporary Art Conversation Series. Uh, we are going to take a brief, like 30 second <laughs> um, break, and uh, then we will be back with the announcement of our award winner. So I hope for those of you guys who are on Facebook that you log back on um, to our award ceremony. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Nezhanako, wo wo, be hard and stay. Nezhanako, ding ding go, be hard and stay. Hey,